I was dubious. I was skeptical of everything that I read, heard, and seen about circumcision. I fully expect you to be, too. I had deep-seated beliefs. I'm sure you do, too. You're going to change your mind in a matter of a few minutes. Buckle up. I think the first place to start with this topic is to understand the word and where it comes from. When looking at the definition of the word from ver many various resources, the Latin word only means to cut in a circle or cut around, circum being the around part and scission being the cut part. Just like the word incision, for example, is to cut into. Just like incision, the word does not specify what is being cut or where the cut is being done. So the question is, how did this word get to the point of being used for cutting off parts of genitalia? Because if you look at the Latin roots, it has nothing to do with genitalia. It's just about cutting in a circle. If religion is really an important factor in this, you have to dig into the roots of the one religion, the Abrahamic religion. I know there's, there's the Jewish religion, which is the root of the Abrahamic religion, and you have the Christianity, and you have Islam. Um, so here are some books on the topic, and as well as a documentary called Cut, Slicing Through the Myths of Circumcision. I'm not much of a book reader myself, so I watch a lot more videos and um, and read websites and stuff like that. So here are some resources for you. Before getting into the medical benefits and the harms of the general cutting practices. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the value of the body part versus the value of removing the body part. And, uh, and the reason why I covered religion first is because if you're staunchly going to stick to your religion, the rest of this isn't going to matter. Um, the value of the body part doesn't make any difference to you. Um, the value of removing it is 1%. Um, if we were doing this on a 1 to 10 scale, um, the value of removing will be a 10, obviously, if you're really that strict about religion. Now, I am, if you want to so use the word circumcised, I am that. Um, and before I had my first child, I would have thought that the value of the body part was zero compared to the cutting off the umbilical cord. And the value of removing it was definitely a 10 because there's all these medical benefits and there's all these, this, all these risks of keeping it um, where it can hurt you later on. Before you can figure out the value of the body part, you have to figure out what is being removed in the first place. Like I was saying earlier about the word circumcision, all it means is to cut in a circle. Um, and the reality is there's actually several different types of um, genital cutting, um, even within the Abrahamic religion. And you'll see, you know, if you look at this, list here, it's not just including male genital cutting, but also female genital cutting, and it's arranged in a way to try to um, show the the impact, the severity of the different kinds of cutting. Um, one thing that they don't include here that I'm kind of disappointed with, but it, it, it's, not, it's not included in the World Health Organization either, is just a ritual neck or pricking of the male um, prepuce or male foreskin. Um, we'll get into a little bit more about 
what the difference is between the foreskin and the prepuce uh, in another uh, slide, but the uh, the point here is that it's not the same. It's, you can't just say circumcision and know what's being cut off. So in order to figure out the value of the body part, you got to figure out what's really being removed. So here you are. This is a video that was, it's basically just a presentation by one man. I'm Mick Oster, and he makes good references to actual studies and articles and, and such out there. Um, it's very well done. Uh, but again, it's presented and spoke to by just the one man. Um, I do recommend watching it. Uh, it's free. It's on YouTube, as you can see here. It's also, I believe, on Vimeo. It's not too hard to find. Um, and uh, this will be a start in understanding uh, the value of the um, of the body part, um, as far as from a male perspective. Um, this doesn't really get into the female side of it much, a little bit, but not a lot. So, um, yeah, I'll talk to you about some more videos um, to go check out too. I feel lucky to have been able to see this movie at a screening at the Social Justice Film Festival in Seattle. Um, it later uh, got distributed to many, many um, sites and, um, uh, on DVD and Blu-ray uh, the following year, uh, and I helped a little bit with the, the funding to get that going. It's I, I especially love this documentary because it's about as non-biased and fair on the topic that you can be. Um, once you learn about this topic, it's really hard to be um, really fair about it. It includes interviews from both sides or all sides of the discussion. Um, and the biggest proponents of continuing the practice of um, cutting boys and even gets into discussions about female genital cutting practices in the world. So I, I highly recommend it. Um, check out the website because what you're seeing here on the screen only covers iTunes, Amazon, Vimeo, and Netflix. Um, it's also available on lots of other resources as well, like uh, as I remember Comcast um, or Xfinity and Walmart and other sites. So check it out. Note that some of these shows were made before the end of 2018, at which time the federal anti-FGM law was um, deemed non-constitutional. And uh, that uh, stuck. Here we are in 2020, and it's still considered non-constitutional. Um, so keep that in mind when you're watching those videos. Uh, I am providing these videos in a particular order, uh, and I suggest watching them in that order. It, uh, they kind of go chronologically. Uh, this one here from Eric Clopper, it's it's a presentation, um, one man presentation. Uh, it's really really good. He provides things in a chronological order that uh, makes everything come together very easily and really nails the coffin um, on, on some things that are revealed by the American Circumcision documentary. Enjoy. Here's a recent documentary that uh, came out. It's available on Amazon, you know, sort of the DVD if you want. It's not as widely available as the American Circumcision documentary, but um, I was surprised that uh, af after all that I've studied over the last about 15 years that uh, I still learn stuff. Um, I keep learning stuff about this issue of genital autonomy. So watch and watch and read and read and study as much as you can. Um, of course, you can, like John Geisker says, you can spend your entire life studying this topic, though. 
he might be thinking by this point. Hopefully not after watching all those videos, but like, isn't all this information that's provided so far been biased, one-sided, all anti quote circumcision unquote? Well, okay. Let's take a look at uh, something from WebMD. Now, keep in mind that organizations like WebMD, um, they might be influenced by money. Um, because medical organizations make a lot of money from this procedure particularly in the United States where uh, health care is not universally covered. So doctors get paid more if they sell more services. One of the things that I keep coming back to and argue um, both with WebMD and uh, Mayo Clinic and uh, AAP and, of course, the WHO and CDC base their recommendations off the AAP. Um, also, keep in mind that AAP is not a government-operated organization. They are um, they are financially driven by medical professionals, uh, the, me the medical industry. So um, I highlighted the risk of injury to the penis. And what, what you'll see in this, as well as the AP um, statement, is, and everything that's copied it, is that they take um, benefits versus risks. But they fail to include the harm, the guaranteed harm, um, if you, again, hopefully by this point, you see that there is harm, that the prepuce, foreskin, whatever you're calling it, is valuable. It's not just vestigial, vestigial plant of skin. So, in this right here, they're saying, what are the risks of circumcision? And they say, however, this risk is low, but then they list off risk of injury to the penis. Now, isn't removing a significant amount of the skin, uh, uh, the tissue, injury? To me, that's a 100% risk. So, in that case, the risk is high. Brian Earp is a very good speaker. He, uh, there's several articles that he's written, and uh, there's several presentations on his YouTube channel, uh, not just about male um, genital cutting, but also female genital cutting, and um, as well as intersex. And I, I place this here. Um, after all the other videos um, that have focused more on male genital cutting uh, to uh, kind of as a segue into the other kinds of genital cutting that goes on in the world. And uh, the more that you study this and listen to this, uh, all the genital cutting practices, the more you realize that they uh, are very much interconnected and the discussions are very much the same. Um, regardless of assigned sex at birth. Uh, I This is a screenshot of just the sexual harm video uh, on his channel. I do recommend checking out his YouTube channel and looking at other videos uh, about uh, general cutting practices. If you aren't already completely sold on the fact that male prepucial amputation harms and when I say prepucial I'm talking about the entire foreskin covering the entire glands head of the penis um, here's a few resources uh, so I'm starting off with the, the circumcisionharm.org site they actually did a survey of many many men and, and uh, more things keep showing up on the site from more um, reports from men, but um, 
these are men that studied the anatomy and uh, and figured out what was um, what they were missing. You got to keep in mind. You have to keep in perspective that most men, at least in the U.S., had it removed when they were infants. So they, like me, I mean, up to age 35, I didn't have any idea what was missing. And I didn't. I just assumed that everything that I was experiencing was probably just typical and normal and whatever. Um, and it took me many years after that to connect the dots to say, oh, well, this would be totally different. Oh, well, that would be completely different. Oh, I had me stenosis. Hmm. And that was probably because I'm missing part of my penis. Um, and I created a group called Intact Male Intactivists on Facebook to get together, uh, get some intact men together to answer questions about what it's like to have a whole penis. Um, and uh, just to verify, validate the information that's out there. So, you know, if you appeal to the authority of people that actually have the whole part, well, here you go. Um, it's a public group, so you can look at the discussion on the group on Facebook without being without joining the group. We're always uh, appreciative of more intact men joining in to comment or post or whatever to um, explain anything more that might need to be explained about what it's like to have a whole member. And then there's Sam here. He uh, he is an intact male activist, and he created a YouTube channel. And he's created several, several videos. And it's not just that he's intact, but he's also a medical, he's in the medical profession. So um, there's a lot of great videos, lots of great explanations. Uh, if you really want to dive in and, and try to understand it. The resources that I've connected you to thus far doesn't go into detail about the surgery, if you want to call it surgery, in depth uh, as much as I, I've i seen. You can look up videos on YouTube that do go into more detail, um, specifics about things like a Mogan clamp, Plastabell, Gomco clamp, and there's more out there, but those are three most popular ones as far as I've seen. Now, just as a disclaimer here, I am not a medical professional. I'm just giving you information that you may want to bring up with your medical professional. So, the Mogan clamp, Plastabell, and Gumco, they cut differently, and they cut in different areas. For example, the Mogan clamp, from what I've seen, and I'm pretty sure I was cut with one myself, because you can look at the timing of when these tools were released as well. <coughs> the uh, the Mogan clamp is more likely to leave more intermucosa and more of the frenulum behind, whereas the Plastibel and Gumco clamp they go further down um, over the glands and cut lower, thus higher up the, the mucosa and also more likely cut more of the frenulum, which, as far as I understand from looking at the Sorrel study, cuts more of the most sensitive tissue. I've also heard that if the frenulum is completely removed, um, that renders a lot of men completely impotent. Again, go out and verify this uh, yourself. This is this is what I've been reading and and um, and listening to and watching for almost 15 years now. Um, there are risks to these tools. In fact, the Mogan clamp, the company was 
sued out of existence, from what I understand. But it's really interesting. It seems like the Morgan Clamp is still being used a lot. Um, it, probably back when it was invented, uh, I think it was invented kind of like the the Jewish Barzell that uh, that Moyles use. Uh, but it, uh, <clears throat> it seems a little bit better in that it it clamps it, it squeezes it down. The uh, the problem is is that there have been cases where it, if it's not put on properly, because there's no safety mechanism with this, it cuts the glands, or at the very least, it leaves a permanent mark on the glands if if it's put down too close to the glands. But again, the upside is that it leaves more frenulum and intermucosa. The plastibel, if if the string that is used to to cut off the the blood flow of the of the prepuce isn't put on just right, you can end up severing the whole glands. <laughs> <laughs> it's extremely scary. Um, or it can also be a source of infection. It, I think that was referred to in the American Circumcision documentary. And then you have the Gomco clamp. And from what I've seen, it seems to be the most popular tool of all. And uh, the, the thing about all of these or both of these is that there's no clear dotted line as to where to place these tools and or how much of the tissue shaft tissue slash um, prepuce is put up on the bell whether it be the bell the gumco or the pasta bell or up into the mugging clamp uh, some doctors flick the penis in order to get it erect, so they are sure not to cut too much, but not all do that. And uh, you might have heard the buried penis reference in some of these ref resources that I've shared with you. Uh, the, the penis, it draws up into the body and, and kind of shrinks away in order to protect itself. Uh, so if it's, if it, at risk, uh, yeah, you, you might end up with buried penis. I, I don't know. Maybe there's more specifics beyond that about buried penis. But if a doctor allows the penis to go, you know, to shrink away and then try to cut the prepuce, chances are they're going to cut way, way, way too much. Um, they should make sure the. They should definitely make sure that the they're not cutting out too much. So, again, there are risks, and from what I've heard recently, there's more than a 10% risk of a botch. So, it, like David Llewellyn says, these happen far more often than people are told. If your whole point of watching this video is to research whether to put your son through a general cutting practice or not, whether you want to call it circumcision or not, whether you're talking about partial or full prepucial amputation, at least you can walk away with this knowing to ask your moil or doctor specifics. But if you're interested in learning more about general cutting practices for females and intersex, please keep watching. I brought back the forms of general cutting chart here Note that this sticks to the, quote, general cutting terminology instead of the circumcision or female genital mutilation or just general mutilation period. So, uh, MGM is a term that's used. Um, but female genital mutilation is terminology that is fed to us by the mainstream. The term circumcision is often used in the female genital cutting practices in cultures. Uh, if you if you look up uh, FGM uh, documentaries and videos and stuff like that, you'll see that quite clearly. They use the word circumcision. 
even in the USA, these practices were done in U.S. hospitals. Uh, it was the late 90s that was made illegal. It was even it was actually covered by uh, by insurance for young girls. With migrations from places like Africa and the Middle East, lately girls are at risk of genital mutilation. This is something that is in the news as a challenge for law enforcement in both the U.S. and the U.K. Just have to look it up. Brian Hart puts it well, though, when he says, It should be up to each person to decide whether they view their own body as mutilated or disfigured. I had an online chat with someone that claimed to be a doctor from Egypt. He was attempting to join an intactivist group that I help moderate. He wanted to join so he could interject his position on differences between female circumcision and mutilation, as though there is a clear line separating the two. When it came to answering the question as to whether the girls consented, it was quite clear that it was still a non-consensual practice. At the very least, the girls are pressured into it, whether it be from you know, social pressures or you know, their culture or whatever. There, there are tons of things I can share here to provide evidence that female genital cutting practices are highly accepted in the cultures where it occurs. This is just one example where benefits are suggested. Benefits such as keeping things from becoming rancid, developing unpleasant odors, infections, etc. Just like what is said about male genital cutting practices. They even promote reduction of sexual stimulation. Here in the Atlantic, uh, it shows a chat where someone is defending the practice as if they can't pray without the cleanliness provided by removing part of the genitalia. Also, here is an article where Brian Earp, it's E A R P, for anyone that wants to look him up, suggests that compared to the penis, the external female genitalia provide, if anything, an even more hospitable environment to bacteria, yeasts, viruses, and so forth, such that removing moist folds of tissue might very well reduce the risk of associated problems. Just because the WHO says that there are no known medical benefits does not mean that there are not any that could be found. Ask yourself, why are there so many studies that exist to find benefits of male genital cutting but not so with female genital cutting? Those who are anti-FGM but not against male may want to take this to heart. If health consequences in the form of health benefits are seen as legitimizing childhood genital cutting, as is often suggested in the case of male cutting, then proponents of female genital cutting, who are loath to give up their valued custom, might be motivated to find such benefits in order to appease their critics. My position is that we are more powerful working together to fight all non-consensual and non-therapeutic those two had to be put together non-consensual plus non-therapeutic genital cutting it's not something to be addressed from a sexist perspective orchid project is one of the organizations i've been working on ending female genital cutting i've been quite impressed with the organization um, particularly since they don't seem to discuss um, or support male genital cutting from what I've gathered so far. And Julia, uh, the founder of Orchid Project, did a TEDx talk and I uh, found it very, very compelling, very um, explained the challenges and, and uh, the ways of addressing those challenges um, very well. and. Uh, I think that that applies to all general cutting. What what she what she explains in her TEDx talk. So I highly recommend the TEDx talk. Um, there are there's actually a a playlist. Um, you can see on the screen here that uh, 
criteria <laughs> nipples and I set up the playlist and made it public for everyone and uh well, 41 videos if you really want to immerse yourself in um, the female genital cutting and see how it differs from one culture to another in, in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, it's definitely not all the same. So it's, it's in a lot of ways, I would say that it's more complex than the male genital cutting practices, um, although those also differ quite drastically across the world. For instance, um, Philippines do a completely different kind of cut than, um, than the prepucial amputation or foreskin amputation that is done everywhere else. And uh, it's very heavily embedded there. So enjoy. Intersex used to be referred to as hermaphrodite problem with hermaphrodite is in the wild you find beings that have both male and female genitalia and they can self-reproduce. Um, intersex is different where you don't necessarily have both ovaries and testes. I've heard of one case where one person had one ovary and one testy. Um, <laughs> I've only heard of one, um, but usually it's one way or the other, but you could have testes and still have a vulva or vice versa. So um, that's what intersex means. I don't remember what came first, whether I met someone that was intersex and they told me their story or if I first started learning it uh, from the Genital Autonomy America website. Uh, You'll notice that the symbol is the same with genital autonomy and genital autonomy America. And I think there's also a genital autonomy Canada and a site that I started called Genital Autonomy Society. Um, I do have a relationship with Marilyn and Milos and uh, who is the person at genital autonomy America. I, uh, I've continued to meet more and more intersex people and uh, learn more and more about the, the, the conditions and the situation. It's, it's far more complex <laughs> than you can imagine. Um, so many variations that are possible. Um, there's a website or organization called OII organization intersex international or I'm sorry organization intersex yeah organization organization intersex international intersex network <laughs> yes. and uh, there's several other organizations but from there you can see there's a whole network of other organizations that they connect to and you can go to YouTube as well and just type in the term the word intersex and there's some videos out there where you can hear stories and um, there's like four four TEDx talks I, I watched so it's very interesting and uh, and again this, this is another one of those cases where I think that people should be allowed to just grow up with what they have when they get it as long as it's you know, things function, you know, they're not going to die because of it. Um, they can wait until they become at age of consent. Now, I'm not going to argue what age of consent is. You know, in most places, people think of that as 18. Um, some states in the U.S. have it lower, like 17 and 16. But, um, and they, you know, parents and children or whatever can probably work it out too but uh, bottom line is genital economy here let people decide for themselves when they get old enough whether they want to remain the way they were born or if they want to be con uh, conformed to the binary or whatever and this I connect it a little bit to what goes on with transgender. I've actually heard of one story one, where one person considered themselves transgender and then found out 
later that they were actually intersex. So it actually explained why they were transgender. So <laughs> interesting, interesting stories out there. Um, it's been a lot of fun time studying this topic. Before I wrap this up, I wanted to I want to give a shout out to some of the large uh, organizations that uh, have been trying to educate people about genital cutting issues, including Your Whole Baby, Doctors Opposing Circumcision, Intact America, Intaction, Bloodstained Men. And there are several others like uh, Forefront and Cockfight, uh, and Tech Ninja Warriors, and I know several other um, individuals and uh, local specific local groups like Intech PDX and Intech Massachusetts. Um, more than I can think to. More than I'm going to put down <laughs> in slides and all on this video, um, I did create, uh, again, like I said earlier, I created genitalautonomysociety.org in order to try to pull all of these organizations together to have hopefully one larger voice. And uh, not too long ago, I created a couple maps uh, where I can put pins on the map trying to show where the various organizations hail from, not necessarily meaning, you know, where they serve. I mean, for instance, your whole baby, they, they're they incorporated in Texas, but they have people all across the United States um, and even people from Europe um, that's working with your whole baby to, uh, to educate people. And uh, it helps to have people from Europe and other places in the world working with us so others know that, you know, how things work outside of the United States. So you, you go to the General Autonomy Society, the org, and uh, look at the two maps. Right now I just have a, a global map and a United States map. I might uh, add more maps as things get more crowded later on, but uh, all you have to do is Click on the on the pins, and uh, you'll find one, two, three different organizations in various places, and, uh, and you can click on those organizations to go to their websites. Thank you for watching this video. Um, thank you for your patience. This is a lengthy subject to talk about. Um, please like and share.